buddies, hello and welcome to another Delve Through the Bowlers World Archives. Happy Monday to you and thank you so much for joining me again. It's always a pleasure doing these things for you. A little bit of a, I'll lead into a little secret. I actually did this yesterday before the United Liverpool Snowdraw Fest. Uh, but when I came to look on the uh, SD card to upload it, there was nothing there. And it was probably the best 47 minutes of entertainment uh, I've ever done, ever. So I'm having to do it again. It won't be 47 minutes long, I promise you that. Thank you for joining me. Remember guys, if you enjoy this video, hit the like button. And if you're not already a Bulls buddy and a member of this community, please hit that subscribe button. It's absolutely free of charge. And don't forget, hit the notification bell for notifications of new content on the channel, which at the minute is three times a week, thrice weekly. Um, so today, uh, Janu January's Bowlers World weren't very good. There was a reason uh, why they stopped, well, Originally, they didn't bother January, February, because there was nothing happening. So they they only used to publish ten issues a year. But once the game boomed a little bit, they realised that they needed uh, January and February just to advertise bold comps more than anything. But of course, as the years went on, there were fewer and fewer bold comps um, being advertised. So they got a bit wishy-washy and a bit thin. This is 12 pages, uh, normally an issue is 16 pages. And I'm looking at Bulls World issue number 245, January 2001. So, front page, always the same, always the same in January. A group photo of people enjoying playing bowls somewhere sunny. Don't you just hate it? I wish I could do it right now. And on the front of... The paper, there's a headline, Not Happy New Year. And to set the scene, 2001, um, television hadn't been involved in Crown Green Bowls for quite a few years now. I think the last time it was shown was 1996 with the Bass Masters. The Waterloo was last on in 1995 on Sky TV. Uh, breweries were pulling out of sponsorship, uh, tobacco companies could no longer sponsor events so they'd gone and they used to be quite big sponsors of bowls and things weren't looking particularly good sponsorship wise and then we get this. The new year seems likely not to be a happy one as far as Crown Green Bowls is concerned. Indications are that the British Crown Green Association looks sure to lose their biggest sponsor, Martell. Reports in the national press last month indicated that the giant conglomerate that is Martell, I think it was part of Seagram's actually, uh, is to be sold off and when rather than if, it is then more likely that sponsorship will go uh, more than likely that with it will go the sponsorship so that's my fault so Martel Cognac had sponsored um, the British T the British Championship County Championship for over 20 years and it had become synonymous really with uh, the County Championship um, you talked about the Martel games rather than county games in Yorkshire they used to talk about Yorkshire ABA team and the Martell team and to try and differentiate between the full county if you will and the parks and everything else that came after so Martell was a was a special special sponsor because they only sponsored two sporting events Crown Green Bowls and the Grand National and then well the sponsorship went now for a lot of counties it might not have made a difference but I know certainly to Greater Manchester um, 
the county games ran at a loss, even if they won it. In fact, in most years, it was probably better that they didn't get through the group stages because they couldn't really afford to play in the semis and the final. So that little bit of sponsorship for winning it made the difference between profit and loss. And with that gone, a lot of counties, uh, a lot of the more successful counties may have actually struggled uh, with finances. I think eventually, I'm not sure if it was the same year or the year after they got Ensley, the insurance company, who used to sponsor Burnley by the way, because uh, they were based, I think they had a big office based in Burnley and they used to sponsor them. Um, Ensley eventually took over the sponsorship of County Games uh, and I have a few Ensley Man of the Match uh, goblets and Martel Man of the Match goblets actually to be honest. Um, and then as you go through um, you go through the bowlers world January 2001 there's not actually that much in there's a lot of winter balls there's a lot of you know uh, pieces interest pieces I suppose you'd call it there was uh, coverage of the first ever federation event that was uh, held in Leeds uh, Bob Itchin was the first winner of the first federation uh, I don't know if it was a merit or they call it a winter warmer um, and that sort of started the federation off and I won't get into the politics of the federation um, but I think it's, it's actually worked very well and given a lot of people uh, a lot of opportunity to play uh, competitive representative bowls uh, that normally would have been overlooked or just not not taken part and, and I enjoy the Federation days I, I must admit I, I used to be a Parks man played for Central Lancashire um, and things happened there and then I took a back seat from, from uh, the Parks and the Federation but a couple of years ago I got asked to play for Corn Valley um, and being being the true blue Yorkshireman cut me in half and I bleed I bleed bleed Huddersfield, you know. Uh, I decided to play and great days out, really enjoyable. The lads who I play with are absolute mentalists, but you know, never mind. Um, so yeah, so the, this was sort of the, the start of the Federation um, and the fragmentation of the parks. Not a lot else in. Uh, you get to the letters page and there's a, a, letters, a letter from um, Mr Fitton, Keith Fitton from Oldham. Um, in, re in regard to Andy Cairns' view that the game of Crown Green Bowls is now dead and he had a response for me. Now the, the previous month or before that uh, I've been interviewed uh, by the Bowlers World. Uh, because in 2000 I won three competitions that were all £1,000 plus first prize and none of them qualified me for the champion of champions which was incredible because there weren't that many £1,000 plus comps and it coincided with um, the time that British Crown Green had lost the sponsor for champion of champions and they wanted each competition to pay an entry fee on behalf of the winner of their competition and a lot of competitions said you can stick that instead of saying yeah no problem we'll take it out the first prize which would have been the more obvious thing I would have happily donated 20 quid of my prize money to play in the champion of champions uh, so winning the Stockport Parks meant nothing I didn't go into the champion of champs uh, I won Patrick Croft Wicked Men's Club but because it was an invitation that was ineligible and then I won a competition in Stoke called the Bucknell X Servicemans and it was advertised as a qualifier but when push came to shove it wasn't because they'd allowed an entry from a homester uh, and one of the qualification criteria was a 128 entry competition had no homesters in of course if you had 256 or 512 you could have Holmes's and of course um, Holmes's have won Spring Waterloo and, and then won the Champion of Champions and that you know, by the bites. Anyway, 
they were wanted my views and I just said well you know it just shows that the competition side of bowls is dead uh, there's nothing to play for yeah the money's nice but that's not why we play bowls competitively um, and it goes back to when the game really boomed uh, it was all to do with television when the Waterloo started on the BBC and, and the champion of champions or the Tom Thumb as it was called um, and then the Bass Masters started in 82 Crown, Crown Challenge all these things County Classic, Top Crown all these things suddenly got people interested in bowling competitively because they wanted to be on television and entries for the Waterloo doubled um, entries for big comps there were thousands, 1,024 entries for some comps 512 they played qualifiers during the week weekday afternoons can you imagine a competition trying to fill now 256 spots and the only time you could play was during a week a midweek afternoon or morning you might get 10 entries um, so that's what I, that was the basic crux of, of my interview but this this guy Keith Fitton uh, it's entitled game strength is in its roots and he made the the um, his view was well leagues are booming so what's the problem and that always seemed to be the view of British Crown Green in general well we've got leagues that are doing really well so what's the problem what they failed to realize is it wasn't it wasn't down to new players coming into the game it was players who are currently bowling but only might only be bowling once a week suddenly they want to be bowling more because they want to be they want to be honed they want to be on practice for the weekends in comps so i know i used to play in four different leagues but i'm only one player but i would have been counted four times in anyone's statistics all of a sudden vets leagues boomed they're booming vets leagues because there were a lot of young vets coming in they lowered the age to 55 and these players they played in an afternoon and they also played at night and they also played on another day and they also played for another club so it wasn't the case that there were suddenly thousands more people bowling it's just that the ones that were already bowling were playing more so it's fine we've got all these leagues doing well so what if Andy Cairns and his mates think that Bowles is dead? It's obviously not. And here we are, 20 years later, we've lost, we're down to about 80,000 bowlers. Um, round about this time, 2,000, we're still maybe over 150, getting on towards 180-ish. That was the estimate. Um, in a very early bowlers world in 1978 I think it was a guy did some some research there and he he, show, he got it to around 180,000 but when bowls was on telly and it was booming you were looking at around 200,000 um, I'm on the view that people only know about the game if they see it and I've said this so many times, that's why television's important. But even big competitions, if you get people watching it, they're going to be more likely to go and play bowls, have a go themselves. And if it's not there to be seen, it doesn't matter how many bowls we have, there's not going to be enough people to play on the greens. We've got greens are going to go. We're going to have outrage and uproar and all the rest of it. And before we know it, we'll have the number of greens that we need for the number of bowlers that there are. Now, apparently Bolton, Bolton Council, in whenever they were building greens for uh, the community in Bolton, they estimated that for every 7,000 bowlers you needed one so every every 7,000 members of the population you needed one bowling ring so if there's 80,000 bowlers that means we only need 11 greens that doesn't work does it but that's the sort of thing that councils work on which is why you've got the situation in Leeds which is why you've got the situation 
up and down the country where greens are going because they're not really needed because there isn't enough of us to use them but of course the vets leagues are doing well and I think back a few years ago and in Rosendale there was two leagues there was the Rosendale Parks and the Haslinden and District and then they started another one on a Wednesday called the Bar, Bar Non. I'd been about 16, 15, 16, so we're talking at late 80s, early 90s. And the people that bowled on a Wednesday afternoon also bowled on a Monday night, also bowled on a Tuesday night. And then clubs started entering the Burnley League, the Rochdale League, the Hindburn Leagues, and all these people were adding to the numbers in these leagues but there were no extra bowlers there were just people were keener because there was something that people could aim for when you had the bowlers in 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 rosendale i look at some of the old draws for Haslinden bowling club and sunnybank and out of 128 entries you had maybe 30 entries from rosendale and if you ran that now, if you ran the same competitions now, you might get five. People aren't as prepared to throw their money into their hat. And anyway, I'm rabbiting on about bowls. But that was my view back in 2001. And to be honest with you, not a lot has changed. And I'm, you can show me as many graphs and statistics as you want about how leagues are doing well. But that doesn't tell you really the true state of the game. Um, and when, now when you can ha you, I can't think of many comps that fill very quickly 128 entries 64 entries yet yeah, fantastic you can fill them in a day 128 entries don't know if you'll fill one and if you do fill one how many of those 128 are going to change over the, the year I reckon you'd have maybe 64 changes out of 128 anyway the last page and it's called the last straw when they call for a straw at the griffin in bowling club huddersfield's winter venue they're not wanting one to slip into the top of a bottle of orange juice i'll have you know it's used in circum certain circumstances to determine who's on when all other methods have failed the straw is known in their rules as a standard and a player's got to have nimble fingers to make one and it's a not not a task for the heavy handed and I think I might have shown you a little bit of uh, uh, somebody cutting a straw if not I'll try and find someone and put it in this video about now oh yeah always playing for five pounds you never ever ever win I'll just flex it <laughs> But basically how it works, if they've measured and they can't split them, they call for a, for a straw. The guy who set the mark has to cut the straw down to size. It's five minutes to do it. Knocks his ball away when he's happy. The other guy picks the straw up and he's got three minutes to balance it between the jack and the ball. If he can, he wins the point. If he can't, the guy that cut the straw wins the point. And also, if he... if if they're measuring for two, it's the guy who's claiming two who has to cut the straw. Now it's not it's not perfect. It does a job. But what it, what there is is an element of skill in cutting the straw. So it's not just about finding out who's on actually and finding by doing a measure like that. you there's a bit of skill involved and who's got the nerve to cut it as short as you can. Because you can cut a straw very quickly and it's not very good. Um, and really you need to take the whole five minutes to cut a good straw um, of course over the years we, they've tried different measuring devices strings uh, the current box type and they all have the faults mainly that the locking mechanism isn't strong enough and you can easily pull on it and maybe just you know cheat a little bit I don't like using the C word but I'm gonna do the thing that I like is the car aerial type measure and I tried to find it earlier but I don't know where it's going I think somebody's nicked it off me uh, and I think they're really good that you can't really 
go wrong with them but they only go up to maybe a meter and after that you have to have rods specially made which you know can be expensive and you know not everyone um not everyone can afford those what i like about the car aerial is it just needs one person to do it you don't need two people and you've you've all seen them bending over with big dangling down and harris on display and they're knocking ball because they took and they don't do it on purpose it's all by accident but it could be improved on well a few years ago i saw um at fox lane for the british team championships referees using a new measure and it had like an l-shaped piece of plastic on i'll put a photo up an l-shaped piece of plastic on and an extended piece on the box that meant that you didn't have this point because that doesn't really the point doesn't help when you when you're measuring uh, with crown green jacks and it seemed a lot better you couldn't everything was square and it was oh it was good and i i looked on the, the website for this company bowls line uh, they're called um and they also did a laser version that came in a little case and it looks all very flash but i think it looked to me like it was more aimed at the indoor market but anyway i've noticed that they've got a new product out and i've got one here and i hope you can see that bowls line and the website is on there bowlsmeasure.com and it's a laser measure that you can use individually and what i'm going to do i've been sent this over the next week or so i'm going to try it out i'm going to go onto a bowling green and use it and just give you a bit of a bit of feedback about the pros and cons of it i initially i think this is brilliant i love anything that's technological and geeky it's really straightforward to use well i'll do i'm going to do a review on this a week on wednesday ac's talking balls laser balls measure maybe this is the future the future might be here but otherwise at the griffin we'll still be cutting straws and people trying to yeah anyway we, we won't go there so guys 20 minutes i've done there. i can't believe it of course when i have a rant about the state of the game that's what happens so i'm going to leave it there because I need to edit all this together and get it out by 5 o'clock. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, there will be AC's Talking Bowls on Wednesday. No idea what I'm going to talk about. On Friday there will be a Bassmasters video from 94, courtesy of Roger the Dodger Morgan. The Welsh Wizard. Boy oh, isn't it? Now he's in Swansea. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. So, thanks for watching. Guys, remember to wear the mask. Not because it's a COVID book, because some of you are a bit ugly. But no, I'm only joking. Remember to wear the mask, guys. Remember to stay safe. Hopefully, I'll see you Wednesday. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.